1. So this happened in my old job during the pandemic. I worked as a travel advisor in a luxury travel agency in France. During this period, no business was coming in, and the French government stepped in to cover our salaries while staying at home. This government aid covers 70% of our salary, and the remaining 30% has to be covered by our employer. This means that we were only allowed to work 30% of our original hours with our company, and that equates to less than 10 hours of work per week. Since there was no business coming in, and since the bulk of my income was commissioned from sale of travel packages, which was not coming in, I had run into a small financial dilemma, and needed a bit of funds to cover my rent for a month. So I reached out to my boss to ask for a salary advance, which is to be deducted from my paycheck at the end of the month. By the way, for context, it is an employee's legal right in France to have a salary advance if needed, for as long as the amount of the advance is covered in full by your end of the month's paycheck. My boss told me that it's not possible and messaged me the following text. If you have personal financial problems, you should check with your banker. I was flabbergasted by his response, especially as I was his top seller and brought in 1.4 million euros in revenue the year before the pandemic. Even though I knew he was a dick, I never imagined he would refuse my access to this right of mine as an employee. I could have sent him a formal letter of demand by mail to force him to give me an advance, as provided by the labor laws, but I decided not to, as I was able to borrow money from a friend. Weeks gone by after the incident and business hadn't improved. The company's funds are dwindling since no income was coming in. To help French companies, the government decided to give them an option to decrease the vacation leaves of their employees by somehow allowing them to impose vacation times when the employees are not working anyway on those days. If I could remember correctly, it was three days that they can fully impose without objection from the employee and four days extra with the consent of the employee. All of my colleagues agreed to have their vacation time except for me and another disgruntled co-worker. Since we still haven't given our consent and the end of this government is nearing, he messaged me and the other employees stating that we are the only people who haven't agreed. He is saying that we should help the company as it is going through financial problems due to the pandemic and that it would be really nice of us to give him our consent. Upon receipt of the message, I promptly responded with the following text. I am really sorry to hear that the company is going through some financial problems but let me remind you of the advice you gave me when I asked for your help a couple of weeks back. If you have financial problems, I suggest you talk to your banker. And that means I am not going to give you my vacation leave. I had the guts to be up front, because I know that he can never fire me due to my performance and very strong French labor laws. And I was also planning to leave soon anyway. I wished I was in front of him when I told him that, knowing him, I'm pretty sure he went all rad and mad when he read that message, and his forehead veins should be visibly throbbing, like whenever he is mad at someone. He was too shook that the only response he gave me was, Okay. I was extremely satisfied with my comeback that I had a smile on my face the entire week. Revenge can really be satisfying. 2. So basically my ex and I had been together for 13 plus years, but in 2019 she got prego with my twins, two boys, and at first things were good, we were living together and her parents, who both don't speak English, lived with us and her sister. I work from home, so I spend most of my days with the boys, and her mom would help and I would be there when I'm not working, but I'm pretty much there every day to be with the boys. We also have a car together, but it's in her name and I pay the monthly. So fast forward about two years, my now ex, I'm not sure exactly what her issue was, but she wasn't talking to me much and wasn't wanting me to see her. So I just come over during the day and leave at night, then go to my other home. So a few months go by and her mom starts yelling at me and copying what I say, so I tell her to be quiet and stop. I guess her sister heard that and told my ex, so my ex and I started fighting about other things and she told me that she didn't want me there, so I left. The next day I text my ex and say that I want to see the boys. She says no. I say, well, you can't keep my kids from me. She said she'd filed a restraining order 
and would wait until we go to court. I said, no, you aren't even home. I want to see my kids when you're not home, so finally I got her to let me see them a few days a week when she wasn't there. A week or so later, I get a mail from the courts saying her restraining order was denied. But the courts had set a date. She got a lawyer. I didn't because I didn't do anything wrong and I knew this. She was just lying and trying to keep the kids to get 100% control over them. So after a few months of me seeing my kids less and less, I got tired of her being in control and told her I was picking them up and taking them to the parks by my place. She knows where I live. It's only about 15 minutes away from her. She texted me to ask when I was bringing the kids back, and I said I'll bring them back tomorrow. She freaked out, came over, called the cops, and nothing happened because of her screaming and saying I took the kids. And I have texts between us confirming what I was doing. Okay, back to the pet revenge part. So, after the restraining order was denied, and she got a lawyer, she wanted to take it to trial, which again was denied, so I gained 50-50 custody, with no lawyer, and she spent so much time to get one to try to keep me away. Now, remember the car? Well, she tries to sue me for not continuing the payments, because I paid in cash, and she said that I hadn't paid her. But as I said, the car was in her name, not mine. Though she never got the key when she took the plates off the car and had it towed, so she ended up winning that case and I had to pay her 500 because she had to get a new key. But I won 50-50 and set time with the kids. After months of not being with the kids, I was able to file for child support and now she'll have to pay me monthly after all the things she and her sister did and the missed time with my kids. So that is my petty revenge. 3. I currently work for a company in France as a technical writer, but I'm in charge of leading some projects linked to the IT service. The latest one was including an ERP, a software designed for logistics, administrative and production fields. Truthfully, we were operating with few tools using Excel or a company-made software, but our main goal was to harmonize our tools and process. The project itself started a year ago, and it was a bit tense but still stimulating. Ten months ago, we contacted every service in the company in order to get requested use on the internal and external tools and softwares. To be clear, we use the database daily to feed the KPI, our statistics and so on. Every service has this and needs of terms of results. The marketing service will get a review of our clients. The global trend on a defined period, for example. Almost everyone answered our question. They told us if they needed some modifications for the upcoming software, or even say if it's good as it is. Except one service, Logistics. Two weeks after the initial mail, we didn't receive any word from Logistics. I sent a new mail to remind them of our project, and if they would give us the request they use in their daily work. Still no response. Three weeks after, we already did around 30% of the total work concerning these requests. I sent a new email to the service in which I've added that if we have no answer in the upcoming two weeks from them, we'll consider that they have no needs, and we'll proceed as requested for the project. Guess what, no response. At this point in the story, I have to clarify something. Each mail was sent to the head of the logistics, while my boss, the head of IT, and the project manager were CC'd. Anyway, let's jump until the last week. In order to have the minimal impact for the company, we have decided to do the migration during the weekend, Sunday precisely, as only a few people would work that day, only for urgent calls. We have done the work, installing the ERP, teaching everyone how to use it, doing many hours of testing and even simulating some scenarios. We converted every request, even for the logistics, and the ERP works as intended. For those who did a migration-like work, you certainly know how stressful it is, and how miraculous it is when your environment works at the first try, in the real production area. This Monday, we received a ticket in which an operator from the logistics doesn't know why all their requests don't work anymore. The ticket was created with a critical status, meaning that this whole service can't work anymore. We were a bit surprised at the beginning, but the shocking fact was the email sent by the head of logistics right after the ticket, demanding that we work on it ASAP. The thing is, I saw his name and the word request. I connected the dots and found my old mail sent to him. Furthermore, 
My boss told him through Microsoft Teams that he told him Sunday the requests are done and the location to download them. I had the pleasure to take the action on the ticket. And I've answered to his email. Dear Head of Logistics, I'm a bit surprised that you asked that kind of work now. Indeed, you may see in the attachments I've contacted you three times previously to ask if you had some demands about requests you use. But you've never answered me once, and as the last mail says, we considered that you had nothing to ask. Besides, my boss told you yesterday through Teams that we did the requests and they're available at this address. You'll find these requests in the attachment too, so your service will be able to work as expected. Feel free to give us your feedback if it works if you have a problem on it. Best regards, Z. That's me. Five minutes after the mail was sent, the ticket went into the resolved status by itself. I wonder why. Oh, and this story is written four days later because it doesn't end on that ticket. It seems the head of logistics did a hidden CC to the president of our company. In fact, we didn't have a clue at first when we sent our answer. But during the afternoon, the president himself sent a mail saying the following words. I don't get why I am in this conversation. However, seeing the development, I'm disappointed in you. How you act, and how late you are in this project that we talked about this morning during our meeting. We have a new strategy meeting each Monday morning. Did you not retain information? You know how we despise that kind of behavior. I'm expecting a big change of mindset from you. And you know that the company already has various experienced profiles in the logistics field, too. Z, my apologies to the services. Yesterday, HR sent a global mail promoting the new ERP. But a paragraph about communication and how important it is was added to the message. I hope someone read that carefully. In short, stop messing with your IT service. We do our best to provide a good experience with your hardware and software, even if sometimes it's a bit hard or totally new. So when you see a problem, or if the IT guy or woman asks you something, don't wait and act. 4. I had been working in a very specialized job field for about 10 years at this point. During my tenure, I had become proficient at looking up raw material specifications used in the production of large flying machines. I was performing work, not duties, well outside the scope of my job description, because the word got out that I was very good at rooting out the material specs, along with how to process them into flying machine parts. I did this because the actual scope of my work was pretty easy, and I had a good system down that kept my backlog down to nothing. I also did this extra work to show my manager that I deserved a decent merit-based raise. And when I said specialized at the top of this paragraph, I meant that I was the only person in this large flying machine company with the certifications to perform the work. Well, raise time comes around, and my manager shows up with a slip of paper that shows what kind of raise we got. He hands it to me and tells me how he was able to get me this awesome raise. What he didn't know is that I have a knack for doing mathematical equations in my head very quickly, and I quickly discovered that it was blowing smoke up my ass. So before he runs off, I tell him to stick around to do the math on my computer to show what I actually got. After I run the numbers, I show him exactly what I had done in my head. The raise I got was what was guaranteed by our union contract and no more. I confronted him about this and he had nothing to say about it. I told him that I was doing the work of an employee at a higher job rating and that I should be getting compensated as such. He tells me to put together a package of what I've been doing and make an appointment for both of us to meet with HR to present my case for an upgrade. I put together my work package, set an appointment and show up for the meeting. The HR lady looked at my package and was amazed that I hadn't been upgraded. We chatted for about 15 minutes because my manager didn't show up, and we were giving him a chance to make the meeting. He ended up being a no-show, which meant no upgrade. Fast forward a few weeks, and it's time for us to write up a list of our yearly goals and objectives. Apparently this is some big deal for management, and they like to use these items to hang over our head as a carrot to chase for raises in the following year. There is a form that we are given to fill out what our business goals are for the next year, 
and how we will execute our plan to make those goals. At the bottom of the form, there's a line for our signature and the date. It was the easiest goals and objectives form I have ever filled out. I literally signed and dated the blank form and handed it to my manager. Needless to say, he had an issue with it and started in on me right then and there. It was in an office where at least six of his management colleagues also had desks. He tells me that I can't just sign a blank sheet, and I tell him I just did, a bit louder than my normal speaking voice. Then, with the attention of his colleagues now garnered, I told him everything that I had been doing above and beyond my job description. How he gave me the BS story of the great raise I got, and his no-show at the upgrade meeting. Then I iced his cake by telling him, All I have to do is not get fired, and I'm still gonna get the contractually guaranteed raise. So I ain't doing nothing extra. Starting with this stupid goals and objectives form. The look on the faces of his colleagues was of utter shock, and he had nothing to say, so I left. He never came back and pressed me to fill out the form. Maybe it was because he still had one of my size 10 stuck deep in his ass. Maybe he realized that he really screwed the pooch and couldn't face me. Shortly thereafter, I was offered a new gig in another department that came with an upgrade and raise. My salary doubled in the 10 years I spent there. 5. So I live in a fraternity house at a Big Ten school. I'm a sophomore in college, and during my freshman year, I dated a girl from roughly November until late August, just before school started back up. I thought she was awesome, and she would always hang out with my friends and I. After we broke up, I was extremely depressed, and would drink every day for around two months. However, she said that she still wanted to be friends... I eventually realized that this was horrible for my mental health and that I was being manipulated and jerked around a lot and told her that she needed to stop treating me like I was a joke or I couldn't have her in my life. We haven't spoken since. It was around this time that my roommate, who was one of my closest friends the year before, began treating me like absolute crap. He would constantly pick fights and call me stupid, question my mental capacity. Not that delicately. I am also slightly on the autism spectrum, so this stung a bit. I just assumed it was because he was attracted to the new girl I'd been talking to, which turns out he was. About two weeks ago, I found out that my roommate had tried to drunkenly confess his love to the new girl, and had also told me that he'd been hooking up with my ex, and the first time it had happened was in the bunk bed underneath me while I was passed out during the two-month bender. When he found out that she told me, he sent her a series of absolutely horrible texts, trying to gaslight her into thinking it never happened. I asked a few of my ex's best friends, who I was still close with, and they confirmed that my ex and my roommate had hooked up. While I was livid, I've been trying to be a less violent and reactionary person. It was then that I realized we were having a Greek wedding with a sorority, and my roommate had been trying to get with an uninterested girl in that sorority for the last year and a half. She was also one of my friends, so I asked her if she wanted to get married. And when we exchanged our vows, where we basically just make a bunch of good-natured sex jokes at each other's expense, I closed it out by saying that I was marrying her so that my roommate had a chance, since he wouldn't hook up with the girl until after I had already done so. I also made him my best man for this. In addition, someone reminded me that he had sworn on the house that he had not hooked up with my ex a few months back. When you break an oath on the house, you get kicked in the balls at the next house meeting, guess who did the honors. My last bit of revenge was to move out of the room and take the refrigerator. However, I did leave behind copious amounts of itching powder in his underwear, sheets, etc. As well as a device that beeps at random intervals hidden in the room. I don't believe he will be able to find it. He has lost any friends and respect he has in the house. And many other sororities in Greek life now hold my ex and ex-roommate in contempt. And they are the butt of many jokes. Don't get even. Get ahead. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge's Ice Cream, episode 238. Please bonk the like button before you go. Thank you kindly. Okay, let's see. And before we go, we have a little shout-out that goes to Reddit user Drumurto. Thank you very much, Drumurto, for allowing us to use your story. That was the second story in this video there. 
Don't think I have any other business today, so let's move right along to Halfreezer's question of the day. And today's question is... What is the most unusual conspiracy theory you've ever heard? I mean, most of them are unusual. But I'm going to mention one. It's It involves two people, but it's basically the same theory. And that is Paul McCartney and Avril Lavigne. Apparently, at one point in their careers, they were swamped out with a double. And the double has just been living their life since then. The uh, Paul McCartney was allegedly, he allegedly died back in like the 70s or something, just before like uh, the, the Abbey Road cover was done. And that's why apparently Paul McCartney looks like he does on the cover. They also try to argue, oh, well, he doesn't look quite the way he used to. <laughs> yeah, because everybody ages, you know, and it's a thing that happens. And the same deal with Avril Lavigne. Apparently she died and was replaced by an Avril Lavigne lookalike who has been Avril lavigne ever since. But maybe you've heard of weirder ones, more fun ones. So please do pop your answers in a comment below. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.